Good evening, welcome. Um, the Federalist Society and the Business Law Society are happy to have you here. The Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies is a group of conservatives and libertarians interested in the current state of the legal order. It's founded on the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. <laughs> um, the Business Law Society is a society organized here at Florida State <coughs> intended to introduce um, law students to the business community and the business community to law students. Uh, we're joined today by uh, Mr. Derek Khanna. Derek Khanna is a Yale Law Visiting Scholar with the Information Society Project, and he's a regular contributor with The Atlantic. David Brooks has referred to Mr. Khanna as a rising star for his copyright policy brief that was published by the Republican Study Committee. The same paper that was quickly retracted after it angered many special interest groups. This year, Forbes named Kana one of its 30 under 30 uh, in law and policy for his work in tech policy and in leading a cell phone unlocking campaign. We're also joined by Professor Sean Bayer. Uh, Professor Bayer holds a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science from Yale Law, uh, from Yale. Um, and a JD from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, before his legal career, Professor Bayern worked in computing research, served on groups responsible for developing programming languages, and wrote several books and articles about computer programming. He also created the Central Authentication Service, uh, a framework that is used by Florida State University and many other institutions. Please join me in welcome. Oh, sorry, I need to drop. I wish every day I could sign up back to that service. It's going to be more than it helps. Please join me in welcoming. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Mr. Kana and Professor Bayer. I'm really excited to come out to uh, Florida State University. It's actually my first time out here. And uh, I wanted to thank the Federalist Society for bringing me out here. And it's a really exciting time for innovation and economic policy right now. And Bitcoin is really at the leading edge of that discussion. And it brings up a lot of really interesting public policy concerns, but also a lot of really interesting opportunities. So challenges, but also economic opportunities. And uh, it's, it really is interesting, particularly for a group like this that's constitutionally minded and um, you know, really cares about things like the Federal Reserve to see a potential alternative on the market that um, kind of challenges some of the suppositions about how the monetary supply is supposed to work. But I'm going to try to keep this discussion kind of at an uh, accessible level. And if you have any questions for me after, you want to get into some of the policy details, I can obviously go on a little bit further on that. He's going to jump into some of the technical details and uh, explain exactly what a Bitcoin is. Um, all right, so I'm trying to figure out my technology here. So now to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a form of a digital currency. It is the first decentralized digital currency through a public ledger that provides some level of anonymity for users in transactions. Bitcoins are mined online, which is a form of, they're not mined, they're mined, uh, and released to people who craft complex math problems. There are currently 12 billion Bitcoins in circulation, and more Bitcoins are going to continue to be released through this mining process until it caps out around 21 million Bitcoins. The smallest current unit is known as a Satoshi in honor of the creator of Bitcoin. Now, to be clear, Bitcoin is not the first digital currency. There have been numbers of others that you probably haven't heard of. Digicash, eCash, Yodel Bank, eBullion, ePassport, Liberty Dollar, and eGold among them. You know, eGold and Liberty, uh, Liberty Dollar were both shut down by the government. At times, these, these alternative currencies have made very powerful enemies. They're destructive. In a recent op-ed in the New York Times, Paul Krugman quoted Charles Ross that these digital currencies look like it was designed as a weapon intended to damage central banking and money-issuing banks. Perhaps, but maybe that's a feature and not a bug. 
The Liberty Dollar was created by Bernard von Nahas, and he was convicted in 2011 of making, possessing, and selling his own currency. His currency, by the way, was silver-backed. And Tompkins was prosecuting an attorney during his trial. He described this Liberty Dollar as a precursor in some ways to the Bitcoin as a unique form of domestic terrorism, trying to undermine the legitimate currency of this country. Eagle, another competitor, was backed by gold, and it was shut down for money laundering. And if you haven't read the money laundering statutes, those are some of the, either, the most easy statutes to accidentally violate. <laughs> But here's what makes Bitcoin more durable. Eagle eventually reached a user base of over 5 million. And while it used a sophisticated encryption technique for handling transactions, it was at its core a centralized currency. Bitcoin is completely decentralized. We don't even know who created it beyond the alias of Satoshi. And that's probably for his own safety. Because it's decentralized, there's no one person to arrest. It is a concept, an idea. Because it's a digital currency, it's in many ways completely detached from the traditional nation-state-based monetary instrument system. And that's precisely why it's so feared. Senator Manchin, has called, Senator Manchin of West Virginia has called for Bitcoin to be banned. He said the clear ends of Bitcoin are for either transacting in illegal goods and services or speculative gambling. And it makes me weary of its use. Therefore, before the U.S. gets too far behind the curve, I urge regulators to work together to prohibit this dangerous currency from hard-working Americans. It's a little funny to say, you know, prohibit this dangerous currency from hard-working Americans. I don't know exactly what that means. Uh, we've already had hearings on this topic. Other countries have gone through the process of banning it, like Thailand and Russia and China, you know, all, all good countries for us to part company with, which is why Manchin says, I'm most concerned that as Bitcoin is inevitably being banned in other countries, America will be left holding the bag on this valueless, valueless currency. So, you know, if we don't jump on board with Russia and China and Thailand, I'm sure North Korea can't be far behind, uh, we're going to be, you know, it, it's pretty unbelievable. And from my perspective, working in policy circles, particularly working on copyright law, I kind of think of this as comparable to some previous technologies that were just as disruptive, but in a very different side of the economy. So in the 1970s, Sony invented the first VCR, the Betamax, 1976. They made it on sale in America for the price of $6,093 in today's money. Almost immediately, 1977, Sony was sued for the Betamax for enabling copyright infringement, allowing for users to record television shows. Now, obviously, you know, copyright statutes and money laundering and the you know, Bitcoin issues are completely separate issues. But what happened was litigation went on against Sony. The Ninth Circuit ruled that it was an illegal technology, basically that it needed to be banned for sale in the United States. And the Supreme Court granted certiorari in the U.S. in the Sony case. And the initial ruling of the Supreme Court, the initial internal tally, was actually to ban the VCR. And as they were internally deliberating, they decided to allow for a re-argument of the case. And in the next term of the Supreme Court, I think it was 1984, they decided to uphold the VCR by one vote. And that is why we have the VCR today. But at the same time, <laughs> well, that's, that's the reason why we have the you know, DVDs and the whole home uh, consumer electronics market. But the reason I mention this is at the same time, Congress was going through the same process because the same guys that went after the VCR through the courts were trying to ban it through litigation, through legislation. And Jack Valenti testified that uh, he was the head of the MPA. He said that the uh, VCR was to our industry as Jack the Ripper is to women home alone. And he said, if you don't ban the VCR, we're going to bleed and hemorrhage, and we're going to cut our movie production in half. Uh, production in half. And Congress waited until the Supreme Court deliberated and came out with their decision. And when the decision came out in 1984, and Sony had sold 2.3 million Betamaxes, 
So many people had these devices that Congress just simply couldn't ban the technology. And as a result, two years later, we found out, 1986, you know, when the movie industry was decimated, when it made more money from home sales of videos than it did from in theaters. My point in mentioning the story is, Bitcoin will win if it gains sufficient user adoption before the regulators ban it. And so it's a, you know, uh, it's, it's how fast can we run, how fast can they chase? And so the real question is, how fast is user adoption going to happen for this technology? How quickly can we realize that it's actually useful in our everyday lives? How can we actually use this instrument? So, I have two scenarios for how Bitcoin will play out. One, it will become a viable competitor for some portion of the market on our financial transactions on a day-to-day -day life. Or two, Bitcoin will provide downward pressure on existing services and they will simply be forced to compete. Either way, we win. Um, we being consumers. And there are a lot of benefits of these technologies, but the real question with all these technologies is what will be the killer app? You can have some novel, amazing technology, but if there isn't something to really drive user adoption, it may still languish. The first cell phone, for example, was an incredible technology when it was developed by AT&T. They did a study to say how many people in the world would be interested in owning a mobile telephone. And their study showed somewhere around 10,000 people was the entire potential market for the cell phone. So you don't always know what the potential killer app is. And so for some people, like Paul Krugman, um, who actually said that Bitcoin is evil, uh, and Alan Greenspan, who basically said that it's silly, um, they don't necessarily see the value. But when you understand how it disrupts existing market models and how quickly it could transition some of them, it helps to, to clarify exactly how this is going to work. So I have four killer apps for Bitcoin. One, remittances. Two, low dollar transactions. Three, anonymous transactions. And four, as a hedge against inflation. Now that's not by any means comprehensive, but those are four things I wanted to talk to you guys about. Because I don't believe that Bitcoin is going to suddenly displace uh, the U.S. dollar, but it is over time going to disrupt these four, um, four things and gradually gain user adoption. So let's talk about remittances. I'm sure it's not the most sexy topic. But my family, uh, my dad was born in India, my grandfather was born in India, we would always send money back to India. Most of the immigrant community sends money back home. It's, you know, my story is not unique. Uh, Mark Andreessen uh, recently wrote that hundreds of millions of low-income people go to work hard jobs and send their money back home. This is, um, I have a number somewhere, I think it's 644.65 billion is spent just on transaction fees for the remittances. It's a $500 billion industry. It's growing at 8.5%. So it gets $500 billion industry. And today, if I want to send money to my family in India, or if somebody in Florida wants to send it to their family in Cuba, first, you may not be allowed to send the money. Uh, any country the U.S. bans trade with, you can't do that. There's trade restrictions of some sort against Cuba, uh, Sudan, Iran, Belarus, Syria, etc. Second of all, there are limits on what you're allowed to send, and there are fees. $25 to $50 outbound and possibly $25 inbound. Third, banks can block the wire or return the money. Fourth, the banks convert the money from American dollars to foreign currency and they pocket the flow of the currencies um, and often charge an additional fee thereafter. Fifth, both parties are now known to the bank and the government. And sixth, the government can tax the funds transferred outside the country, sometimes as high as 30% just for the foreign banks, for banks that don't adhere to U.S. rules. Bitcoin, on the other hand, if I have my family set up a Bitcoin account in India, well, there's no bank fees. There's no foreign currency fee. The most I'm going to pay is 25 cents for a service like the wallet. I can send 10,000, I can send 100,000, I'm paying 25 cents. We have potential relative anonymity. Uh, there's no real restrictions. Uh, there are still tax implications, of course, but no one's actually
actually reporting on our cash transactions. And it's nearly instantaneous and getting faster every day, particularly in the alternative currencies of the future. So that's one major market that is being disrupted today, a half a billion dollar market. Second of all, anonymous transactions. Now, first of all, if you're using Bitcoin with the belief that you have a fully anonymous transaction of an illicit nature, you're probably doing it wrong. You're transacting on a public ledger. At any point in the future, somebody can look through that ledger, and if they have enough information to identify you, uh, then they can find out exactly who you paid and how much. Therefore, it's not anonymous. It's pseudo-anonymous. It's, it's actually, therefore, much more identifiable than cash-based transactions. So if you're going to buy drugs, you probably are better off using cash and buying it from a friend as opposed to doing it on a public billboard that will exist forever. There was a great parody on this topic, and I'll let you guess the author. He said, A physical dollar bill is a printed version of the dollar note issued by the Federal Reserve and backed by the federal full faith and credit of the United States. They have gained notoriety in relation to illegal transactions. Suitcases full of dollars used for illegal transactions were recently featured in American Hustle and Dallas Buyers Club, as well as the gangster classic Scarface. Dollar bills are present in nearly all major drug busts in the United States. According to the DOJ, crime in the United States, more than one billion in cash was stolen. In, the, in Saddam Hussein's compound, a car load was found. When Noriega was arrested for drug trafficking, you get the idea. We're, of course, talking about how the American dollar, if it was introduced today and everyone used credit cards, would be seen as a dangerous, untraceable currency linked to crime. So, as I said, it's not truly anonymous. But there is a benefit there to some level of anonymity. And just to give one example on uh, the business side, if you are a married man and you would like to buy pornography and you would prefer that your wife did not know, uh, the predominant alternative today is that you go into a store, which no one does anymore, you get it online, use your credit card. Perhaps you would like for that transaction not to be listed on your credit card. Well, if those websites uh, were able to accept transactions as Bitcoin, now you have a relatively anonymous transaction. Your wife is probably not going to know that you use Bitcoins. She may find out another one. Um, now, you may say, well, that's just one you know, small industry. Well, it was actually the porn industry that led the adoption of the VCR versus the Betamax. It was actually the porn industry that led the adoption of Blu-ray versus HD DVD. So it's these niche markets that sometimes really move the economic plane. Um, next up, low dollar transactions and online microtransactions. So most people don't know this, but every time you use your credit card, you're paying an interchange fee, and that can be between one and three percent. But it's actually much higher for those merchants because they have to internalize the cost of returns. They have to have the infrastructure to handle chargebacks. They get too many chargebacks, then they lose their credit card. They have to pay an enormous amount of money. And, and the process is when you buy something as small as a coffee, you may be paying um, 75 cents to a dollar simply on the interchange fees. Um, because for lower end transactions, the interchange fees are significant. Higher. Now, when you buy you know, a PlayStation 4, the interchange fee is less of a big deal because if it's $500 and it's 2% plus 30 cents, it's not that big of a deal. But when you're talking about a significant or a small transaction, it is. And that's why you see like Starbucks today with their, you know, their loyalty app trying to get you to make larger transactions on paper and then spending it out at their, at their facilities. But if the transactions are effectively free, which is what Bitcoin really allows, then those interchange fees go away. And then as a deflationary asset, recently Paul Krugman and Greenspan have effectively gone to war against Bitcoin, particularly its deflationary properties. Now, we shouldn't be surprised that Greenspan, chairman of the Fed, uh, has a problem with the currency that um, you know, would impact his inflation-based model for the dollar. That's not surprising at all. But current fiat currencies as printed by the Fed are inherently inflationary. And we're trusting the federal government to simply not print more money into the future. 
But the goal of the Fed is to inflate the currency, is to inflate the currency, have a healthy level of inflation and a low level of unemployment. And going into the future, we're soon approaching a level of debt where the only way that we can finance it is through inflation. So it's, it's important for Americans who are worried about that, who are perhaps hedging their bets in something like gold, to be able to see something like Bitcoin as an alternative asset. But there are other countries that have more legitimate and immediate fears of inflation. In Kenya, for example, it's something they deal with every day, which is why Kenya, which stereotypically we probably don't think is the most connected nation as far as the internet goes, one third of their citizens in Kenya have a Bitcoin wallet. One third, which is significantly higher than the American information. Now why? It's because for Kenyans, the ability to have Bitcoins is a heads against inflation. And we have throughout history had countries with hyperinflation, like Germany in the 1920s, Zimbabwe. Um, having the ability, even if the citizens don't use it, but the ability of the citizens to take the money out of the system is something that helps control the system. As Friedrich von Hayek once said, history is largely History is made up of stories of inflation, usually inflation engineered by governments for the gain of governments. But with Bitcoin, there's a new sheriff in town, which is math. I'll, I'll jump along so that way you can talk about some of the technical details here. Um, but I wanted to address some of the concerns that people have about Bitcoin. So Krugman and Greenspan in particular were bringing up, you know, what is a Bitcoin? It's just a series of zeros and ones, it's online on a public ledger. There's nothing backing it. It's not real. What's backing the American dollar? Nothing. The American dollar isn't real. That's perhaps why the American dollar says right on it, in God we trust. Um, but the, math, the Bitcoin community is counted with a math we trust. Currencies only have value if you give it value. When you're playing Monopoly, that Monopoly money has value because you're trading it with other people that also value that currency for the period of the game. So any commodity has value in that others recognize it to have value in that same market. And just as the American dollar is a fiat currency, uh, the Bitcoin is not necessarily backed by anything as well. Uh, but Bitcoin is, is completely different, um, unlike the American dollar, which we have no idea how many dollars are going to be created tomorrow. We know the exact number of Bitcoins that could possibly be created in the universe, 21 billion. And, you know, basic economics will tell you that currency is basically a myth, a creation. Uh, Milton Freeman has a story about the island of Yap. Um, their medium of exchange, they called it the Fay. It consisted of large, solid, thick stone wheels ranging in diameter from a foot to 12 feet. This was their currency. A noteworthy feature of the stone currency is that it was not necessary for the owner to reduce it to possession. So they would keep it all in one place. These were large stones. They couldn't bring it around. But after concluding a bargain which involved the price of a too large to be conveniently moved from one place to another, its new owner is quite content to accept that the bare acknowledgement of ownership and without so much more as a mark to indicate the exchange, the coin remains undisturbed in its new owner. So in other words, if he has Fay and he buys something for me, he can keep it at his house and I just know it's my Fay. That worked for their society. You know, what was the actual value of this currency bag? There was none. It reminds me of the Tom Sawyer novel, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer novel, where he says, you know, the only thing needed to make something more is in order to make a man or boy cover the thing, it's only necessary to make the thing difficult to attain. Bitcoins have value because there's only a limited number of them. American dollars have value because there's only a limited number of them. Both of them have value because of supply and demand. The other counter criticism, the other criticism is, well, you know, digital currencies, the prices fluctuate. They go up and they go down and they go up and they go down. Well, that's true. They are a, uh, a, a, a certainly fluctuating currency. Uh, they, they've gone up quite a bit. 
what all currencies go up and down. And if you look at the Zimbabwean dollar during their hyperinflation, it went quite down. And if you look at some stocks throughout history, they've gone quite up and they've gone quite down. But Bitcoins being in the hands of relatively few, we would expect that it would be a volatile currency. Bitcoins being an asset that we are still learning about, are quite sure of. We read stuff about you know exchanges like Mt. Cox being hacked. There's reason to fear new technologies. We should expect that as new technology would be volatile. But as I said, as it expands into greater circulation, we would expect that the volatility begins to be removed. Similarly, as the, there emerges a futures market where you can bet on the future price of bitcoins, just like you can do for American dollars or for stocks. That also removes the volatility. But lastly, it's almost irrelevant how volatile the currency is, because the true value of Bitcoin, at least today, is perhaps greatest in that it's a protocol for transaction, rather than necessarily a currency. And what that means is, is, if you donate money to Reddit.com, and you donate through Bitcoin, the second that you donate to Reddit through Bitcoin, and it's free for them because they don't have to pay interchange fees, so they love it. They immediately convert it to American dollars sitting in their bank account. So if the price of Bitcoin doubles from today till tomorrow, no one is, is well, in that case, the better. And if it, if it collapses, no one is worse off because the transaction is concluded nearly instantaneously. Um, so just to, to, to all that point, let's say the, you know, the ratio is you know, 8 to 1, and um, you know goes up to nine to one tomorrow. It doesn't really matter because they're going to get the corresponding number of bitcoins. And so, as a form of pro uh, protocol, this fluctuation argument is irrelevant. But the last thing I want to leave you with is that Bitcoin is improving. Bitcoin is version 1.0 of a decentralized currency, and there are some problems. One of them, for example, is that the thing takes a relatively long time to clear. Uh, it's a lot faster than wire transfers or credit card transactions, but I mean, a series of minutes on an online frictionless world is relatively unacceptable. Newer currencies are instantaneous, um, alternative currencies. Um, other issues are you know, the ability to have uh, payment through an escrow system. Well, Bitcoin doesn't really allow you to do that. You have to go through intermediaries. New currencies are building that directly into the algorithm. Um, and so what we're seeing is that the Bitcoin is really the beginning of a emerging trend of new coins. You know, we have Ripple, we have Litecoin, we have Kanye coin, uh, a whole bunch of digital currencies. You know, and today there are over 3,000 physical merchants that accept Bitcoin. Those are physical merchants, including one right here in Tallahassee I checked. It, the store is Apogee Signs. They make business cards and they accept Bitcoins. So maybe you can all join me after, we can buy lots of random stationery for <laughs> um, But major websites such as Overstock, WordPress, the Pirate Bay, PayPal, Reddit, Tesla, OkCupid, um, uh, EZTV, Tiger Direct, all accept Bitcoin. Why? Because it saves them money. And of course, you can also book your flight to outer space with Bitcoin, which is what the Inkobus twins did. Um, so in conclusion, Bitcoin is a new disruptive innovation that, that is disrupting the international monetary system by allowing for nearly instantaneous transactions across the world. And it holds the promise of crossing into the mainstream tomorrow. And the downward pressure that Bitcoin will place on incumbent industries will ultimately lead to better and cheaper services for us all. If the payment providers continue to charge a 2% rent on all transactions, American Express, Visa, and MasterCard, they simply won't be able to compete. And eventually that 2% tax will be removed. And that 2% tax on all transactions being removed will lead to pretty robust economic growth. But to all this, Western Union's decision to avoid adopting that newfangled technology because Western Union was a telegraph manufacturer, and when somebody brought to them the telephone, they said, well, why would we use this? The telegraph is perfectly appropriate for communicating messages. Why would we want to be able to have voice messages? 
They said this telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. I'll leave it to you. <laughs> Thanks. Um.